very slowly and there are a lot of people who are just not involved. Uh, if you look at Google stats, you'll see that about 40% of their traffic is currently IPv6. And this is uh, primarily being led by the uh, mobile carriers as everything is moved towards phones and tablets and things of that nature. IPv6 has become more prevalent on the internet at large because they have been one of the uh, pioneers of adding IPv6. Uh, but adoption by traditional ISPs has been very sluggish. Uh, I actually have, at home, I have a straight fiber drop, one gigabit down, 100 megabit up, and I do not have IPv6. A straight fiber drop from Cogent will not give you IPv6. Uh, I think Charter, or is it Comcast, one of the two, one of those two has actually pushed out IPv6, but they're about the only traditional uh, ISP that's done so here in the U.S. Uh, the others... Shut up. <laughs> but it's, it's very uncommon, and it's much less common in the uh, data centers. It's actually more common to have it at home than it is to have it in your D.C. So let's look at... Who's adopting IPv6? This is a breakdown of just some of the top countries. and We see France, India, Germany, Malaysia, Greece, Saudi Arabia, United States, and Japan. And Looking at these countries and trying to figure out what they have in common, I can't seem to come up with a whole lot. I mean, you can look at France, Germany, uh, United States, Western, you know, democracies, wealthy nations. There's something in common there. What what do they have in common with Greece? That's an Eastern Mediterranean country that's traditionally very poor. I think everyone remembers, you know, 10 years ago, the big crisis Greek had economically, or Greece had economically, needing bailouts from Germany and such. Malaysia, definitely not a rich Western-style country. Japan's pretty dog doggone wealthy. They at least have sort of a a westernized economy even if their culture is still very eastern. Saudi Arabia, what the hell do they have in common with anybody on this list? Same goes for India. And let's look at some of the countries that are missing by absence. Look at, you know, China. You might look at India and say, you know, well they're a developing up-and-coming country with a population of a billion. Well, China's a developing up-and-coming country with a population over a billion and their IPv6 adoption is goose egg, zero. So the, the adoption via nation seems to be somewhat haphazard. Some are big into it and some are not big into it and there doesn't appear to be any particular rhyme or reason as to which countries will be very involved. Note that, you know, Great Britain's not on this list. They have some but not a ton of rollout. Uh, Italy, not on the list. They have some, not a ton of rollout. They might be, you know, countries that you might say have a lot in common with Germany and France. Uh, so in those countries where people are adopting IPv6, who is? So first it's the, the mobile networks, as I mentioned earlier. Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, when they were still a thing. They were very big early adopters of v6 for obvious reasons. They suddenly had hundreds and hundreds of millions of new devices that needed IP addresses and they couldn't afford to go out and get IPv4s for everyone. Uh, CDNs such as Cloudflare, Akamai, the public cloud providers, AWS, Azure, those guys. And basically anything from, you know, your top websites. It still says FANG here because I don't know what the new acronym is with everyone changing to Alphabet and Meta and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, you know, those really big tech-focused sites, they're all IPv6. But who isn't? So among the businesses, large and small, there's tons of people who are just not doing anything with v6. I've been working at Rackspace for seven years with a focus on networking. I'm, I'm the guy they come to when they have the really weird networking stuff. Uh, and in that seven years, I haven't seen a single ticket, a single phone call from a customer who was really even remotely interested in IPv6. Uh, and this is from, you know, you might say, well, you get a lot of mom and pop, you know, very small businesses and they don't know. 
This includes names of businesses that you definitely know. Uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss any of those, but uh, I'll tell you about one later that's actually not a Rackspace customer, so I can talk about them. I have some intimate knowledge. So if we look at you know the, the small businesses, they don't know about IPv6. They don't know what's important, or even if it is important. They have no idea, no clue, and it's not even on their radar. Uh, you know, these are the people who are, are still running applications that they wrote in PHP 5. Uh, and yes, that you would be astonished at the amount of PHP 5 that is still on the internet today. <laughs> Perhaps both. Uh, but, you know, because they have a minimal number of, of servers, even if IPv4 networking costs increase, it's not a major increase on their bottom line. You know, most places will charge 10, maybe 15 bucks for an IPv4 address. If you only have three or four servers, that's not a, you know, a, a major cost increase. Uh, and, you know, they tend to overlook IP, IT expenses. It's just a line item for them. They don't, they don't care about it. They're not an IT company. They just want to sell you whatever product it is they have. If we look at big businesses, this is where things get a little interesting. These people tend to have bespoke applications, uh, things that they things that they wrote. They're, they're not typically running your off-the-shelf WordPress sort of things, right? And they were written before they ever even considered things of IPv6, and they're not going to go back and rewrite them to make it IPv6 because the cost of the rewrite is is too tremendous. Um, Imagine a video game company, and I'm going to use an example here because they're actually not one of my customers, so I can use this example. This is pure speculation. I have no idea about their actual internals. Uh, but let's say there's a small indie company. Let's call them Activision Blizzard. Uh, and imagine that they wrote a video game, I don't know, Warcraft 3, you know, 20 years ago or something. They didn't build in IPv6 support to that, and they're not going to go back and do so. Uh, the cost of updating things like that are just too expensive. Uh, more frequently, uh, if they can do so, they will tend to run a, a piece of software until they absolutely cannot do it anymore, and instead of trying to update it, they'll replace it. So if software age isn't a major problem, they tend to hold back because the benefits of, you know, adding in IPv6 just aren't seen to outweigh the negatives of not. And as long as IPv4 continues to work, there's no immediate impetus for them to go to IPv6. This is an interesting and somewhat speculative aside here at the bottom. As more traffic gets shunted to IPv6, we might actually see address space in the IPv IPv4 world it's a tongue twister. Uh, we might see IPv4 addresses start to free up. That's speculation, but who knows? If that does happen, it might wind up reducing the cost of IPv4 networking for them in the long term. So when do big businesses actually change? This is based on my real world experience in working with them. They tend to only do it when it's absolutely necessary. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5. We had people that ran it to absolute death. The only reason they ever got off of, IP, of Rail 5 was because its open SSL version would not support TLS 1.2. Your company sucks. <laughs> uh, we are currently struggling, a lot of our customers are currently struggling to adopt uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 or 8 because they have a large fleet of 6 and 6 continues to work despite the fact that it's been EOL for what, almost two years now? They don't give a shit. As long as it continues to work, they'll continue to do it. It doesn't matter if it's supported or not. Uh, we're actually kind of pushing them to do so by charging them more for support of uh, EOL, but that's that's here and there. They tend not to adopt new technologies that aren't backwards compatible. Uh, PHP 7, we still see a ton of them with PHP 5 apps. 
and they don't care. Uh, Java, anything, every version of Java is incompatible with every other version of Java. That's generally a rule of thumb. This goes treble for Ruby. Uh, Python 3 adoption, still sluggish. I mean, all, all your new operating systems have it, but if they wrote an application in Python 2, they might port it because that's a fairly easy port, generally speaking, but they may not. They tend not to adopt new things if they're not backwards compatible. So let's ask ourselves, why has an IPv4 run out? If you've been attending self for very long, you've uh, sat in maybe this very ballroom and listened to people from Eric or Iana or someone tell you, you know, the sky's falling, that, you know, IPv4 is completely done. We have no more new addresses. And, well, that's sort of true. Generally, it means that they've assigned out their last slash 8. A slash 8 is the largest amount of IP addresses that uh, IANA will assign out to someone. It's uh, 2 to the 24th power uh, total number of addresses. In North America, they ran out, I think, seven years ago. Don't quote me on that, but it's been a while. So why haven't we run out of IP addresses? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, if you look into the the public clouds, you know, AWS, Azure, GCP, and stuff, you'll see that generally you don't get a public IPv4 address, not for every instance. You tend to get something uh, in a private address space, either an RFC 1918 or another one we'll talk about here in a moment, and everything is supposed to go through a proxy or a load balance or something along those lines, which does have a single IPv4 address. And then we'll talk about NAT. Everyone knows about network address translation. You run it at your house. If you don't know about it, why are you here at this conference? While it's not as common in the USA, uh, many ISPs around the world don't even give you a public IPv4 address anymore. Uh, this is because internet has kind of become, you know, in the early days of the internet, it was. It was something that every hobbyist did. We, I can hook up and other people can come to my computer and get stuff and I can go to other people's computer and get stuff and that's not the way it sort of works these days. It's more like a consumer thing. It's, it's I'm not offering services as I'm just consuming. And you don't necessarily need a public if you're just consuming. And additionally, they added a slash 10 to the shared address space. So everyone has heard about the 10.0.0.0 uh, the slash 8, the 172.16 slash 12, and 192.168 slash 16. Everyone's heard of those. Those are the RFC 1918 ones that you probably use at home, right? There's also the shared address space 10.64 slash 10. This was created for carrier grade NAT. And whether you know it or not, you're using it if you have a phone. Uh, if you pull out your cell phone and you go to Google and you type in, you know, how do I find my IP address on my phone, you'll see a lot of people saying something like, just go to whatismyip.com uh, or icanhasip.com and it'll give you the, your phone's IP address. It's not true. Uh, if you install a, a tool like Hurricane Electric has a decent app for this that will show you the actual device information. You'll find that your phone's IP address is in that 10. Dot, sorry, in that 100.64 slash 10 range, uh, and it's all being natted. So what are the limitations in that? Well, in theory, a single IP address it could have two of the 24th IP addresses behind it. That's the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 address space, right? That's 16 million some IP addresses. But there's other theoretical limits we need to consider. There's only 65,536 ports in TCP or UDP. So if you have a, a very popular website like, I don't know, Google, Netflix, Facebook, uh, what have you, that uh, if you have a ton of, uh, a ton of uh, nodes behind your NAT that all want to communicate to that one uh, destination, you're going to run into TCP port saturation with NAT. Uh, the practical limit's usually a little bit lower than that 65,000 number. Example, uh, AWS NAT gateways, they limit you to 55,000. Uh, if you have more than 55,000 connections behind an AWS NAT gateway, 
all going to the same destination IP, they will start to fail uh, simply because it cannot NAT that many addresses. So previously we looked at some of the business reasons why uh, businesses wouldn't do it. It's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. We don't, we don't want to change. Let's look at some of the technical reasons. So first, it wildly diverges from IPv4 in completely incompatible ways. There's a lot more changes in IPv6 than just the larger address space. And I don't think a lot of people understand this. They think IPv6 means 128-bit address space. Uh, but it's, it's wildly different. Uh, we'll discuss some of those changes in a minute. And one of the big technical hurdles is that every network admin knows IPv4 and almost none of them know IPv6 very well at all. Uh, and this is uh, one of the key technical problems, in my mind at least, is the impossibility of the numbers in IPv6. This is one of my IPv6 addresses at my house. Good luck remembering that when your DNS breaks. Uh, there's also a thing called linked local addresses. I won't go into a whole lot of detail on these things. They're impossible to remember. They're extremely difficult to troubleshoot in a TCP dump. And they're 100% required for IPv6 to work properly, uh, or really to work at all. There's a ton of stuff that you would think would go to my public address, but no, it goes to a damn linked local address for some ungodly reason that you don't understand. Uh, and Good luck, you know, TCP dump, IPv6 dot adder equals, well, 2001 colon 470 colon blah, blah, blah. And then you find out it's on a link local address and it doesn't match. Here's a little bit more about the impossibility of these numbers. Let me count this real quick. Hundreds, thousands, millions, trillions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, sextillion, sextillion, septillion, octillion, nonillion, decillion. So that's 340,000 whatever the fuck comes after the killion. <laughs> to put this in, in perspective, geologists uh, estimate there's about seven and a half sextillion grains of sand on Earth. And astronomers estimate there's about six billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. That is 7,561,830,376 unique IPv6 addresses for every grain of sand on every Earth-like planet in the entire Milky Way galaxy. That's too damn big a number. <laughs> so let's talk about DHCP for a second. Everybody understands DHCP. You all use it, right? You have a DHCP on your router. You maybe even configured DHCPD.conf on your Linux box. Uh, it offers a nice single, easily understood uh, facility for handling out, handing out IP addresses automatically. It gives you your IP addresses, it gives you your DNS assignments, it gives you your routing assignments. If you uh, are booting, you, you know, if you're running something like an IP phone, it'll do a TFTP server so your IP phone can go out and bootstrap itself. Uh, you can do zone file updates in DHCP. It's wonderful. It's great, extensible, everybody understands it. Uh, and it's a single, nice, easy place to competently arrange things. And now in IPv6, we have to deal with both DHCP and stateless address auto configuration, which is an abomination dreamed up by someone who took too much cocaine. <laughs> so IPv6 was designed with the idea of stateless address auto configuration. Now this is I'm not going to go into all the details. Originally, the idea was we, we don't actually hand you out an IP address. We hand you out a slash 64 of IP addresses. That's 2 to the 64th power. So we give you the first 64 bits, and then the next 64 bits, you get to decide whatever the heck it is. And what we'll do is we'll use your MAC address, and we'll you know fudge it a little bit. We'll add FFFE somewhere in the middle, and we'll flip a couple bits, and you tack that onto your prefix, and bam, here's your free IPv6 address. And you don't have to configure anything, except it didn't give you routing information. It didn't give you DNS information. It didn't do a zone file update. It didn't give you any TFTP servers. It didn't do any of the things that DHCP actually does. They've added additional extensions to IPv6 to handle all of this stuff, but 
good luck getting it all to work. You can also run DHCP v6, which tends to be a lot easier. If, if nothing else, instead of giving you an address like 2001 colon 470 colon 1F blah 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 blah, it'll probably give you a whole bunch of zeros in a row and then a one at the end. Uh, but DHCP v6 doesn't necessarily handle all the stuff that DHCP v4 did, like routing assignments. Because in IPv6, routing assignments are handled by the router and not by DHCP. Uh, if you've ever worked with IPv6, you'll understand that it has this thing called a routing advertisement. Basically, a router has to go out and do a multicast, uh, send out a multicast packet, which everybody has to uh, accept, which says, you know, I'm a router, here are my routes. Add them to your routing table. Um, so they, uh, the routers will, in stateless, uh, stateless address auto configuration, they hand you out that prefix, and then you do the whole Mac stuff. Uh, but they also handle doing all your routing tables. So in reality, if you're going to implement IPv6, you're dealing with three different things. You're dealing with DHCP v4 because you're still using IPv4. You're dealing with DHCP v6 because now you know you need something logical that you can easily centralize, such as, I don't know, hey, give this same IP address to this MAC address every time it asks for one. Uh, and you have to deal with router advertisements. Uh, this is, you know, one for the price of three. What you got, Zach? Because I don't want to talk about your employer. <laughs> I didn't build that into the discussion. Uh, yep. Uh, which is one of the reasons I have an iPhone. Uh, so let's talk about ICMP. Uh, I, a lot of us tend to think of ICMP in the same sort of way that we think of TCP or UDP. It's something that lives over in the transport layer. It's not true. It's a networking protocol. It's part of internet protocol. Uh, and ICMP in IPv6 is fundamentally different. It's, it's I mean, IPv sorry, ICMP has always been a requirement for IC, for I, there's too many dang acronyms that all begin with I in this discussion. So for Internet Protocol 4, you need an Internet Control Messaging Protocol 4 in order for that thing to work. Uh, anyhow, uh, ICMP has been changed to handle a lot of the tasks that a lot of other things did. For example, ARP. ARP is gone. Uh, entirely. Does anybody know what ARP is? Does anybody not know what ARP is? Okay, ARP is Address Resolution Protocol. Basically what it does is it says, uh, who has IP address 192.168.1.1? Broadcast that out to your LAN. And then every machine that doesn't have that address just drops it into the bit bucket. And the machine that does has, say, 192.168.1.1 is, here's my MAC address. So it's a way to uh, tie IP addresses to MAC addresses. That's gone in IPv6. It's replaced with something called NDP, Neighbor Discovery Protocol. Does basically the same sort of thing, just works differently for no damn good reason. Uh, so one of the philosophical ideas behind IPv6 is they wanted to get rid of broadcast. They said there's too much broadcast stuff going on with IPv4 so we'll just replace it with multicast and make everything listen to multicast, which is fundamentally no different than a broadcast. Uh, so anyhow, uh, Neighbor Discovery Protocol works by sending out an ICMP packet. Instead of being to the broadcast address, it goes to a specific multicast address for Neighbor Discovery Protocol and says, hey, who has this IP address? And the one that has that IP address says, hey, my IP address is MAC address. Same thing ARP does. It's different, but it's the same. Uh, ICMP v6 is also used for something called MTU discovery. Is there, does anybody not know what an MTU is? Maximum transmission unit? 
I'm going to assume nobody's raising their hand, but by the blank stairs, I'm going to assume nobody knows. Uh, so the MTU is the, the biggest size of a frame. When I say frame, think packet. When real network guys talk about frames. Uh, impersonators talk about packets. Uh, so the framer packet, the, the biggest size it can be is the maximum transmission unit. In 802.3 Ethernet, that's 1,500. Uh, if you uh, have to tack something on, like, what was that? Yeah, uh, or DSL, uh, your GRE. Uh, you generally wind up dropping down the, uh, the uh, MTU size in order to prevent fragmentation. In uh, IPv4, uh, there was no way to know what the maximum transmission unit was between, say, my computer here and Google's computer somewhere out there in Cupertino. Uh, I would have to bounce from here to a Wi-Fi router to Charter or Comcast or whoever the hell, and they have to go to some, you know, uh, major link provider, and it goes through a few routers, and then it gets over to Google. And every one of those steps on the way could, in theory, have a different maximum transmission unit. Uh, ICMPV6, I was just to actually discover this. Previously what happened was I would just send out a frame and it would be as big as my MTU would allow me to make it. And my router would get it and it would forward it on and its router would get it and it would forward it along and eventually it would get to a router that had a smaller MTU. And when that happened it had to sit there and break the packet up. It's called fragmentation. Break it into two smaller chunks, send them out, the next frag the next router had to get it, reassemble it, and then send it out again, perhaps breaking it up a second time. Uh, ICMPv6 allows us to do MTU discovery, which works sort of like trace route. It goes out and it says, hey, what's your MTU? And it gets that back. And then it goes to the next uh, destination and says, hey, what's your MTU? And it gets that back. And it goes to the next one. And then it finally looks at all the list and says what's the smaller MTU, the smallest MTU along this link. It gets that and then uses that as its maximum transmission unit. It's actually more efficient. It's just different. And finally we get to the very biggest change and that's or, or the very biggest challenge and that's just fundamentally incompatible with IPv4. And as long as people continue to use IPv4 everyone who uses IPv6 is going to need to maintain some way to talk to IPv4, which means usually that you're going to have to have a whole IPv4 stack. You could use a gateway that proxies connections, uh, you know, effectively reinventing NAT or uh, something similar so that IPv6 only host could communicate with IPv4 host on the internet. That's difficult, it's painful, it's time consuming, it's easier to just maintain an IPv4 stack. Uh, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, and I didn't have room on this uh, presentation to post this, there was a wonderful thing. Does everybody remember Slashdot? You know, back in the day, Slashdot actually used to get used. Uh, <laughs> And, and 20 years ago, everyone had a different solution to the spam problem. Does anybody remember going on Slashdot, looking at the comments, and you would see, you proposed a technical, judicial, something uh, approach to resolving the spam problem. Your idea will not work, and here's why. And there was a long list and a checkbox beside each thing. We can do something similar with IPv6. Uh, IPv6, it advocates a technical approach to resolving IPv4 exhaustion. It will not work, but it requires immediate total cooperation from everybody at once. Specifically, it fails to account for huge and existing investment in IPv4. That's the real reason IPv6 won't be adopted. So what are the lessons we can learn from some of IPv6's failures? First of all, backwards compatibility is key for critical systems. If you want to uh, move to something else, making sure it's backwards compatible would be uh, a, a very wise of you to do. For example, uh, one of the things we could have done instead of doing IPv6 is we could have just expanded 
you know, we could have kept IPv4 as is, just expanded the address space to say 42 or 48 bytes. And this would have maintained backwards compatibility by allowing us to continue to use the old 32-bit addresses just as part of a new subnet that begins, or that begins 0.0. .0. Uh, it would be very easy to convert an IPv4 address to an IPv next generation address in this sort of scenario. IPv6 has some technical benefits to it. You know, we discuss things like MTU discovery and neighbor discovery is technically a little bit better than ARP, but really doesn't make a whole bit of difference. But it's only technically better if it actually gets adopted. Uh, the people who don't adopt it receive absolutely no benefit from IPv6 and neither does anyone else who adopts IPv6 that needs to talk to them because they're still maintaining IPv4. So any system or protocol that requires everyone to cooperate all at once is crippled if not doomed. Uh, we saw this over and over again with solutions to the spam problem, going back to that analogy. As long as someone out there continues to only use IP the IP version 4. Yeah, if only everyone would just problem. We wouldn't have to look at your face. <laughs> So as long as anyone out there continues to only use IP version 4 and you want to communicate with them, you're stuck maintaining IP version 4. You can't just move to IPv6 and get rid of IPv4. V4 is here to stay for, it'll probably be still around when I die. Uh, this is somewhat analogous to the tragedy of the commons. Is anybody not familiar with the the tragedy of the commons, okay, that what I expected people to be less familiar with. The, it's a, a psychological or perhaps a philosophical problem that basically states uh, when something is held in common, it will be abused by someone, more or less. Let's think, of, think about the oceans, for example. And let's say every nation in the world got together and said, you know, we need to, we need to police the oceans, we need to make sure that they're they're harvested sustainably and we don't overfish these things, blah, blah, blah. And we all get together and we make a treaty and they say, well, okay, every country, you know, the U.S. can pull this many fish out. Great Britain can pull this many fish out. France, Spain, Portugal, blah, blah, blah. Everyone gets a quota. Well, what if I don't like my quota? Are you going to stop me from getting more? And once I start breaking my quota, what good does it do anyone else to continue to maintain theirs and so someone else breaks it and it goes on and on and on like that um, so there's some idea of that so I'm gonna close this off and then we'll go to questions I hopefully left plenty of time for questions and answers um, this is a list of companies that I just determined because none of these companies are to the best of my knowledge rack space companies uh, so I can kind of talk about this. Well, some of them are. Some of them are. Oh, sorry. I'll read them real quick. So these are companies that aren't using IPv6 as determined by a quad A lookup for www.whatever.com. Berkshire Hathaway, British Petroleum, Cardinal Health, Cigna, Costco, CVS, CVS Health. Exxon Mobil, Foxconn, General Motors, Home Depot, JP Morgan Chase, Kroger, McKesson, Samsung, Shell, United Health, Volkswagen, Walgreens, Caterpillar, Delta Airlines, American Airlines, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Nestle, American Express, Prudential Financi, Prudential Financial, Pepsi, Anheuser-Busch, UPS, Target, and John Deere & Company. None of these apparently have any IPv6 deployments at this time. Uh, I grabbed this just by looking at a list of, you know, like Fortune's largest companies and just went down the list and, you know, the vast majority of them didn't have uh, IPv6. I skipped anything that was owned by China or, or a government uh, and just went with names we knew. 
Uh, there were some that did have IPv6 deployments. Ford.com did, uh, but most of them did not. Um, and I can't talk about all these because maybe they used it somewhere internally or for some site that I didn't check. I don't know. I didn't possibly check, you know, every particular host name. I just checked, you know, www.whatever. Uh, but I can speak a little bit about Morgan Stanley because I turned down a job with them recently. They, uh, they were looking for someone to run E-Trade, basically run all the networking in E-Trade. And uh, I spent a lot of time talking with them, and, you know, they asked me, they really needed somebody that really, really knew networking because they did, or they do, some really friggin' cool stuff. Uh, so in order to do uh, as low latency networking as possible, because if you, if you imagine, you know, if you're moving tens of millions of shares of a stock, that little penny price change that may occur between when you submit a request and when the request is actually processed, that's a lot of money, right? So they need to get network latency to an absolute minimum. So they do things like pin a uh, particular process to a CPU, a CPU core, on one side of the north bridge and hook that up to a NIC on the same side of the north bridge so a request for that, from that application to the network doesn't have to cross the chipset. Uh, I mean, they, yes, yes, okay. And, and that means, you know, every one of these machines has multiple default gateways, you know, so you have to do policy-based routing on every one of them. They asked me about that. I'm like, yes, I wrote the documentation for policy-based routing at Rackspace. And then I asked them point blank, uh, what do y'all think about IPv6? And the answer was, we have absolutely no intention of using IPv6 in the foreseeable future. So, very big company, E-Trade not going IPv6 anytime in the near future. So that's all I've got for now. Uh, let's go to questions and answers. Go ahead. too late. Someone beat me to the punch and they got absolutely no uh, no backing from IEEE. Uh, go ahead, miss. Yes. Uh, I think that's a little bit of a failed analogy in that particular aspect because uh, for, for those of you who can't hear, who, who didn't hear, uh, she was making an analogy about, you know, change does happen. For example, in, in the past we used steam engines uh, and we don't do that anymore and, and why, but it's important to recognize we still use those railroads. We replaced the steam engine with a diesel electric locomotive but the diesel electric locomotive runs on the same rails that were used before. Even the same gauge, it's what, four feet, ten and a half inches? Eight and a half inches, that's right. Uh, I'm not a railroad buff, sue me. Uh, I don't have a witty comeback for that one. But in that sort of analogy, uh, yes, we have, you know, cars and stuff that we didn't have in the age of steam, but uh, we uh, are still using that same railroad system. It's, you know, some of the train or the locomotion engine has changed a bit. Before I get to you, Zach, I think you had a comment? Someone here? Okay, no, Zach.
Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, Eric. I don't say a damn thing to them because I ain't going to be able to persuade anybody in three minutes. But uh, okay. if if we're – the minimum pitch is that as the Internet expands, especially globally, IPv4 networking is insufficient to satisfy everything and becoming more and more expensive. IPv6 is the cheaper alternative in that it is long-term sustainable. Uh, without the uh, resource exhaustion. Effectively, we're seeing that IPv4 addresses are uh, a limited, valuable commodity that is being traded currently. And as they become more and more exhausted, the value of those things uh, increases exponentially. Exactly. But but I suspect what would actually happen were I to have that discussion is Berkshire Hathaway would go up and buy every single IPv4 address they could and then resell them at a profit. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's, you know, companies look at it, they do the math, and they decide it's not worth the investment. That's just the the hard, cold truth of it. I suspect eventually it will. Go ahead, Noah. I didn't ask anybody. I just looked, I just did a dig for a quad A record. Oh, Morgan Stanton. Uh, they were offering me a job. So I asked, you know, they were, and, and all the questions were, you know, extremely difficult networking type questions. Uh, and then I asked them the extremely difficult networking question of what the hell are you going to do with IPv6? And the answer was nothing. Uh, which was great because I don't know IPv6 nearly as well as I know IPv4. Uh, and then I wound up turning the job down anyway. Anybody else? Come on, there's plenty of stuff you can ask me. Where did I get this great, amazing shirt? How did I get so sexy? Lots of biscuits. Lots of biscuits. See me after class. <laughs> Well, there's nothing else. I guess we'll finish up a little early. It's uh, only a quarter afternoon, and we had till 12:30. I figured y'all would have a lot more questions than this, or maybe I just talked too quick. Go ahead.
I suspect long term, companies are going to wind up slowly adopting IPv6 over the next 10 years. Uh, and for the next 20 years at least, everyone will maintain an IPv4 stack of some kind or another. They'll probably be natted behind, you know, they might be in that 100.64.0.0 slash 10, or they might be using a traditional RFC 1918 NAT space. Uh, but everyone will continue to maintain IPv4 for probably 20 years uh, as they adopt IPv6. And it is only when IPv4 traffic as a sum total is an absolute trickle that companies will begin to just say, well, the cost of maintaining IPv4 outweighs the benefits of maintaining it and begin to, uh, to uh, get rid of it. Sort of the same situation we're in now where people are looking at and saying the cost of implementing IPv6 isn't necessarily worth the, pro or, or worth the gain. Uh, when that changes and they begin finally adopting v6 and v4 traffic becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, then they'll say in their new deployment, well, is it worth spending the money to maintain v4 in order to, uh, to uh, you know, keep this small bit of traffic, or can we just dismiss that because those people probably have v6 connectivity anyway? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. That's a good question. So imagine the situation if you have, you know, 10,000 nodes, uh, but you're not offering public services. You know, maybe you're, I don't know, H&R Block or something, and you have a ton of accountants who all have you know, computers sitting at their desk, but you're not actually offering. Long term, you're going to have to adopt V6 because the, uh, the, uh, those computers are going to want to talk to a website sometime. They're going to want to talk to someone else who is in that situation and is adopting V6. So long term, you're going to have to eventually get there somehow. Uh, but that will be slower on their part, I suspect. Someone else had a comment? No. I wish it would, but it's too late. Yeah. And any other, you know, competing implementation faces the same sort of thing. Uh, there, the decision has been made for better or worse, and we're stuck with it. Uh, it's too late to try and change course into something else now. Although I really wish we didn't have to deal with 128-bit numbers. Go ahead. Yeah. Think about it this way. It's taken us 20 years to get to the point where V6 still isn't adopted. Do we re really want to, you know, 
flip everything and start over again and now it'll be 2024 or 2042 and we'll be looking at IPv7 still isn't it really adopted and I'll have to give this speech again when I'm 62. <laughs> Go ahead. So it took absolutely zero time. Uh, what came before IPv4, I'm trying to remember the name of it. God, it was before my time. The internet was tiny. Teeny, teeny, tiny. What? NCP yes, yes, NCP. Uh, basically, everyone decided on, you know, April 1st or whatever day, we're all going to switch to IPv4 at the same time, and everybody did. Yeah. It was that long ago. But the internet was so tiny. I mean, everybody uh, agreed, you know, this is when we're going to flip, and everybody flipped at the same time. Go ahead. No. Uh, mistakes, probably. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> A 45 automatic wheel. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to say you're a bad person for doing that because that's what I used to do because having it loaded used to slow your network to a friggin' crawl if you didn't have a proper V6 address. Uh, I think it's probably time to try and get over that and see what you can do to to embrace the suck uh, and and just move on. Somebody else, I think. Yeah, go ahead. The amount of load you can haul, exactly. But that, that all analogies are poor, you know. What what's the old what's the old uh, what's the old cliche? Uh, gosh, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. Uh, the steam to diesel is probably one of those that's usefulness has probably surpassed its lifetime by now. It's a very short analogy. I'm very sorry. Hmm. I haven't heard that one. No, this was all models are wrong. Some models are useful. It's from an actual scientist. I'm trying to remember his name. I can't. Uh, anybody else? We are eight minutes. Good. I'm hungry. Let's go eat. <laughs>